We'd like to welcome our worldwide radio audience to the regular worship of the Main Street Church of Christ. We'd like to ask you to worship with us at this same time and same station from the safety of your own homes. We know that hundreds and, yea, even thousands and millions of you throughout the world risk your life for the sake of Christ as you labor under the boot of oppression of totalitarian governments and Islam and and uh, the madness that's overtaking the world today. But you can tune in at the same time and same station from the safety of your own homes and take the Lord's Supper, and you too will be a church of Christ. You know the, the churches of Christ in the, in the Muslim world now today, there's a big movement of home churches, and we have helped establish many, many home churches throughout the world. They're generally four, five, six people. They can't afford to get more than that there because they'll get caught. And they have to sing very quietly. Can you imagine having to sing real quiet or you get your head chopped off? These are people who really, really believe. Jesus said in Mark 16, verse 15, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And you know what they did? They believed what he said, and they did what he said. Verse 20 says, and they went forth and preached everywhere. What do you think everywhere means? They went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the words with signs that followed. Every church in the first century believed that it was their job to take the gospel to the whole wide world. Well, prove that, preacher. Okay, look at 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. The church at Thessalonica, Paul could say, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost so that you were examples to all that believed in Macedonia, that's Greece and northward, and Asia, that's, that's all of Turkey and all that area through there. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Asia, but also in every place. What does that what mean, in every place? In every place your faith to God is spread abroad so that we not need not to speak anything. The church in Rome thought it was their business to take the gospel to the whole wide world. In Romans 1, 8, first I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Brother Paul, Paul stand up here, he's our missionary. When are you going to India, uh, Zimbabwe? The April. 23rd. April 23rd. We're going to set him apart as an evangelist next Sunday, and we're going to also set apart Joe back here, our, our overhead man and computer man. We're going to set him apart as a student evangelist. And so uh, any of you have any objections to these people, you need to go to them and talk to them about it and uh, uh, try to work it out. And so in those days back then, they had to send an evangelist, they had to send a missionary like Paul to Zimbabwe or to India and to Cambodia, the many places that he goes for us and other congregations who support him going to these places. That's the old way of doing things. But now the modern way today is going out to all the world by radio and we now have 12 broadcasts that are going out on five super stations that covers the entire earth over five times, plus our AM FM stations that we have in North Texas, all of Oklahoma, all of Tennessee, parts of Alabama, Kentucky, and up through there. And so we have a we have a wonderful uh, radio ministry. We're going to study the parable of the reward of discipleship this morning. If you'll open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 19, 
We're going to begin studying in verse 13. Then there were brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Suffer the little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. You need to become converted and to become as a little child if you hope to become part of this kingdom of God, this church of Christ, this kingdom that Christ has come to prepare. If you want to prepare, you want to be a part of that, there needs to be a conversion in you. You need to change from being like a wild animal, like a lion and a bear and a, and a tiger. You need to change and become as a little child because that's what the church is, the real church is like. Matthew 19, verse 15, they're harmless. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. And behold, one came to him, saying unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said unto him, Which? And Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell all that thou hast, and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard this saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Mark says Jesus looked upon him and loved him. Jesus would not have done this if the man was a hypocrite. So he was a good man. Jesus stated the <clears throat> sum of the Ten Commandments recording it on the second table of stone that when God gave the Ten Commandments. The first table of stone being those are commandments that have to do with worshiping and honoring God. <coughs> the second table has to do with those and uh, how we honor our fellow man. Then he added the verse and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, which is a summary of the law. Will a rich young man give up all for Christ? Jesus did not want one of his disciples to be separated from the others by great wealth. If this man was going to join the apostles, he needed to become just like them. God requires every rich or poor disciple to surrender all to him. He does not require owners of property to sell all they have, but he does require that they use what they have in the honor and glory of God. God has made rich people in his kingdom of God, and he needs people with substance and with money so that they can support the work and help the work in the kingdom of God. And so there's a lot of ordinary people, and there's some extraordinary people in the kingdom of God, monetarily wise. But all that's required of the person is that they surrender all they have to God. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily or truly I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is the church. Very seldomly will that type of person be converted. Hardly enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for, the cam for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus uh, beheld them and said unto them, with men, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Mark explains who all this rich man is by saying in Mark chapter 10, verse 24, And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered and said unto them, 
Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches? Notice those words. Trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. The proverb used to express the greatest of improbability. The camel is the largest animal that was owned by the Jews. The figure of speech used here is very vivid and it's emphatic. It represents the largest animal trying to go through the smallest opening. There's uh, Matthew 20, uh, 19, 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Peter contrasts himself with the rich young ruler. If he had given up all to follow Jesus in order to inherit eternal life, the apostles had forsaken all for some time and had been following him for over two years. So their question is, well, what do we get? I'd like to encourage our radio audience to visit uh, our website at www.mainstreet-churchofchrist.com. There's a thousand sermons on there, a thousand written lessons, all kinds of links. You can get a college education on that website, www.mainstreet-churchofchrist.com. We have forsaken all. What is the reward for a lifetime of discipleship? Matthew 19, 28. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall shed, sit in the throne of his glory, you shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. The word regeneration here that's used in this, this verse has given commentators trouble throughout the centuries. The Greek word is only used in reference to our baptism at conversion. In Titus 3.5 as an example. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he has saved us. With a washing of regeneration, when you were baptized, you should have been regenerated and become a new creature by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. If you really became a Christian, you repented and were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you received the gift of the Holy Spirit at the same time. So these verses work hand in glove. They work right together, not by works of righteousness, which we have done or we saved. In other words, our good works won't save us. I can't give away enough hot dogs to save me. Why? Well, I've broken God's law. Just like you've broken God's law. Every one of us are lawbreakers. Every one of us. And it is the law is of such a nature as if you sin one time, you die. So all of us being lawbreakers, there's no way to be saved by doing good works. The only way that we can be saved is by faith in coming to Christ in the appointed way. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy has he saved us when he died on the cross. And then we, in accepting and coming to him in the appointed way, by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. There are two possible meanings of this uh, uh, twelve apostles sitting on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. There are two possible meanings. One refers to the future resurrection of all men at the end of time. According to this view, the day of judgment and the recompense will come at that time. And uh, the other view is the regeneration belongs to the period from Pentecost, from A.D. 30, until the coming again of Christ. And so during that period of time, the apostles... Uh, the church has a new birth when all men come to Christ and become new creatures. The, uh, during that period of time, the Son of Man sits on his throne uh, of glory at the right hand of God. So Christ is raised from the dead. He is seated upon a throne of glory right now, 
In Acts chapter 2, verse 30, speaking of King David, he being, the, uh, he, therefore, being a prophet, David, and knowing that God is sworn by an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, a descendant of King David, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to what? Sit on his throne. Christ is seated on King David's throne right now. He's not coming back at the end of time to sit on David's throne. He's seated on David's throne. He's been seated on David's throne 2,000 years. He's going to always be on David's throne to sit upon his throne. In uh, Mark 16, 19 is another verse. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up to heaven and sat at the right hand of God. And then the Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews 1, 3, speaking of the nature of Christ, who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person. You want to know what God's like? He's just like Jesus the expressed image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. In Colossians it says that by him do all things consist, hold together all the natural laws of the universe, the laws of gravity and thermodynamics and all the laws of science are all held together by Christ and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins. Notice we didn't have anything to do with it. He did it by himself. Jesus purged our sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The apostles are not promised thrones of glory like Jesus has, but simply thrones. The idea is that the apostles are judges. During their lives, they arranged the New Testament laws and practices uh, while they were on earth. They set, helped establish the church, put up the belief and the practices and the doctrines of the church, and now by their inspired writings, they govern all the members of the church. This means, uh, meaning of this sitting upon thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, makes use of the word regeneration as Titus 3 5 does. Back to Matthew 19 29. And everyone that has forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or fathers or mothers or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. To inherit is to receive from an ancestor and applies to one that has a claim and an expectation of something in the future. I have an expectation of everlasting life. I have an expectation of inheriting everlasting life. And I have an expectation of inheriting rewards, which is a separate subject from that. But I have an expectation of inheriting everlasting life because it's been promised me. The expectation of receiving eternal life is to be heirs of God and join heirs with Christ by faith and obedience. It just doesn't get any better than you will inherit eternal life. It's a hundredfold better than anything you've ever seen, your eyes ever heard, your ears have ever imagined. In 1 Corinthians 2.9, it says, But as it is written, eyes not seen, nor ears heard, neither is entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. I have been everywhere and seen everything. I've been to Fort Worth, Woolworth, and Leavenworth. I've been to a luau at Waikiki Beach. I have seen the most magnificent things on earth. And heaven is a hundred times better. Eternal life is a hundred times better than anything we've ever seen, anything that we've ever heard about, anything that we can imagine in our mind. Heaven is a hundred times better. Clayton Tuggle is rejoicing at the great luau 
You talk about chicken wings. Man, him and Lou Lou Ann, they've been separated for 10 years by death and life, and now they're together in everlasting life. It just doesn't get any better than everlasting life. Why would you miss the promise of everlasting life? It doesn't cost anything. You can't buy it. It's a free gift of God. All you can do is mess it up and not inherit it. That's all that you can do. Matthew 19.30, But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. What Jesus has accomplished in his life, death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel, would be for all who are in Christ, so first or last is irrelevant. doesn't matter. The simple bottom line is, this is the context, verse 27 through 30, is the context for the following parable that we're fixing to study. We'd like to encourage our radio audience to go to our website at www.mainstreet-churchofchrist.com. There's a thousand sermons on there. There's video sermons on there. You can now watch us, and you can watch our sermons. You can worship from the safety of your own home. There's all kinds of written lessons. You can print them. You can teach them to others. I'm happy to report to you that there were 259 churches that came to our website to get information last month because they're called .org, and and you can tell. Look in your bulletin. You can see them. Let's go to Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is likened to man that is a householder that went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. The disciples who became apostles were expecting great honors in the kingdom of heaven because they were the first to be called among the Jews. The Jews were then expecting exclusive honors in the kingdom of God because they were Abraham's seed. And they thought, well, the Gentiles, uh, they had really warped views. They thought they'd be kings and that the Gentiles would be servants. And then, of course, the Essenes, they thought that they'd take the sword and go conquer the world like Islam is trying to do now today and that they would murder everybody that didn't uh, uh, repent. Just exactly like Islam is what those uh, the Essene Jews were thinking. The kingdom of heaven is the church of Christ. What's it like? Well, it's like a man. It's like Jesus in, in Matthew 13, verse 37. And he answered and said unto him, He that soweth the good seeds, the son of man. We have a divine teacher. Jesus is our teacher. He's God. He's a divine teacher. John 6, 44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up the last day. As it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God, Isaiah 45. Every man, therefore, that heard, has heard, hath heard, and hath learned of the Father, cometh to me. If you've really, really heard and really learned about God the Father, you'll come to Jesus, because Jesus is taught throughout the Old Testament. The Jews right now today do not read their Bible. They refuse to read the Bible. They read the Babylonian tabloid. They read the Jerusalem tabloid. They read the Meshina. They read the, the writings of the rabbis, but they do not read the Bible. They won't read and study the scriptures, and the reason for it is that the scriptures all teach of Jesus. They've always been that way. They've always refused God's word. In Hebrews 1, beginning in verse 1, God who at sundry times, different times, and in divers manners, what that means is here a little, there a little, Isaiah said. All throughout history, God has given his revelation as an unfolding revelation. Moses gave you part of it. Then Isaiah gives you part of it, and Samuel gives you part of it, and Jeremiah gives you part of it. 
and then along comes all the other different prophets, and they all give you a little part of this unfolding revelation. Here a little, there a little, and it all adds up in its totality when you get the bottom line. It's the scripture, all of the scripture put together, rightly divided is God's word. God who at sundry times, different manners, spake in times past, how did he speak? To the fathers, to the Jews, how did he speak? By the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his son. He still speaks by his son. How does he speak by his son? Well, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then Jesus put his spirit upon the apostles and inspired them to write Acts and Romans and Corinthians and all the other books of the, of the New Testament. And so Jesus still speaks. He still speaks by his son. God still speaks right now today by his son whom he hath appointed heir of all things who is Jesus well he's divine by whom also he made the worlds he is the spoken word of God it created everything in a world and so if you drop down now with me to Hebrews 8 beginning in verse 8 and finding fault with them, with the Jews of the Old Testament, he saith, God saith, Behold, a day comes, saith the Lord, that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I recorded them not, saith the Lord. God made a covenant with the Ten Commandments, the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. He entered into a covenant relationship with the Jews. The Jews said, all that the Lord has said we will do. They didn't do it. So they didn't continue in the covenant. So God's got a different covenant. Verse 10, for this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord that I will put my laws in their mind, not on tables of stone. You've got to learn this. You've got to be taught about the Lord Jesus. I'll put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. You ought to be practicing Christianity from the heart, and I will be unto them a God, and they shall be unto me a people. They shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. A Jew kid is born, he doesn't know the Lord. He's got to be, as he grows up, he's got to be taught to know the Lord. So Jews had to teach people for them to get into that covenant. They had to be taught to know the Lord. But if you're in this kingdom of God, if you're in this church of Christ, you're part of this new covenant you will have already known the Lord. You will have to know the Lord to get into this new covenant, to get into this church of Christ, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. you got to know the Lord. you got to believe on the Lord to get into this new covenant. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Oh, thank God. He'll be merciful and forgive our sins. And their sins and iniquities... I remember no more. God can't even remember my outlaw days. He can't remember your outlaw days. He can't even remember it. Now we can, and in some ways it's good that it should temper us and, and keep us humble, and it should make us constantly crying to him and thanking him for dying for us and forgiving us and being good to us and putting up with us and being merciful to us and not destroying us like a bug. I'm telling you, there's some people, if I was judging things, there's some people I'd smash right off the bat. You know, I'm like a bug. I'd be getting them and, and be real simple. But God is better than man. God is kinder than man. God's got a better deal for us. 
This divine teacher calls all that comes to God's vineyard. Look at John 6, 44 again. No man can come unto me except the Father which has sent me. Draw him, allure him. It's like bait. It's like bait on hook. God allures us with his goodness, with his kindness, with his mercy, with his love. He allures us unless God draw him and I will raise him up the last day. That's a deal. That's a deal. Shake on it. That's a deal. I'll take it. First John 4, 10. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins, the buyback of our sins. He bought us back. We sold ourselves to the devil, but he bought us back with his own blood. He paid the debt. Romans 5, 6, For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for good people. It's not what it says, is it? He died for people like you and me, the ungodly. That's who he died for. He died for sinners like us. Romans 5, 8, But God commended his love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The householder is owner of the field or the vineyard. Israel was the vineyard of the Lord. Throughout the Old Testament, Israel is referred to as the vineyard of the Lord. In Isaiah 5, 7, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looketh for judgment, but behold oppression, for righteousness, but behold a cry. In every age and every hour, it is he, God, through Christ, who calls and teaches us in these last days, which is the whole Christian age. John 6, 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, that means gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and their life. Let's drop down to 2 Timothy 3.16. How does God call us? All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Theopopneustos, God spoke, God breathed. It's like a sailing ship being carried along across the sea. God inspired, God breathed the very words into the prophet when the prophet spoke and the scribe wrote, the prophet spoke the very breath of God. It is God breathed is what the word of God is. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished all good works. And if you want to be perfect, You'll learn how to rightly divide this word of truth because there are millions upon millions wrongly dividing it today. You'll learn proper hermeneutics, which is a $50 word that means let Scripture define Scripture. If you have a word, Webster's Dictionary is not going to give you a proper de definition of the word What's going to give you a proper definition of the word is the Bible. Where that word is used throughout the Bible, you go read every verse and then you'll know what that word means. 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead, at his appearance and his kingdom. Preach the word. So that's the job of an evangelist, of a person like me. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove. The first thing you do and you, when people act up, you, you try to re gently reprove them. You take them aside, you gently reprove them, you tell them, don't, don't be talking like that, brother. Don't be acting up. Don't, no, don't be acting out. Don't be showing yourself no, no more. You gently reprove them. Then if they won't accept reproof, the next word here is reprove, rebuke. Reprove, rebuke. 
So he keeps getting stronger. And so you go to him with a witness. And then the next thing, you disfellowship them. You put them out. But the whole idea is to get them to repent. That's the whole idea of discipline within the church. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Do it according to sound teaching, according to the Bible. Do it the Bible way. We always do it the Bible way around here. In the morning, sun up, six o'clock in life, the beginning of life. Matthew 20, verse 2. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into the vineyard, the denarius. The, world, the, the wages of a day laborer in those days was a denarius. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. The Jews divided the day into twelve equal parts, both day and night, were then divided into four parts each. Again, a penny is a day's wages. What does the world pay us? In Romans 6, 23, it says, the wages of sin is death. You notice the prodigal son didn't even have shoes on his feet. You'd be surprised the people that show up here don't have shoes on their feet or don't have drawers. It's amazing. Sin will take you all the way to the bottom. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 3. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle at the marketplace. The third hour is 9 o'clock. Still early in life. Come to the vineyard. Maybe you're only 20 years old. Come to the vineyard. Come. Isaiah 55 verse 7 tells, tells them how. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man is thought. And let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. It's an amazing thing, but God really does know our thoughts. He reads us like a book. He knows when you have hate and envy and spite and deceit in your heart. He knows all those things. He reads you like a book. He reads me like a book. It's very important. Notice these words again. Let the wicked forsake his way, what he's doing. So if you're acting wickedly, Forsake, stop what you're doing, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Notice, bad thinking will make you just as unrighteous as smoking cigarettes, drinking beer, or doing anything else. Bad thinking will mess you up just as bad. And the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, for he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, and he will abundantly pardon. Verse 4. And said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatever is right I'll give you. And they went their way, those that were hired at 9 o'clock in the morning. Verse 5. And again he went out about the sixth hour, and the ninth hour, and did likewise. The sixth hour, twelve noon. 35, 40 years old, half your life's over. It's noontime in your life. The invitation is open. Come to the vineyard. Ezekiel 18, verse 31. Cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? And you, the church, are the house of Israel now. Some people, it's the ninth hour, three o'clock in life. Maybe you're 50 years old, 60 years old. Come to the vineyard. Life's almost gone. Isaiah 118 says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. See, God is a reasonable God, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. 
Though they be red like crimson, like blood, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. It's a carrot and a stick with God. If you be willing and obedient, He's going to bless you. And if you're bad, He's going to curse you. And everything you tur touch will just turn into poop. It won't be any good. It won't work for you. Nothing will work. Bad things will happen. What comes around goes around in life. You sow bad seed, you're going to get a bad crop. It's just that simple. And about the eleventh hour, verse 6, and about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and said unto them, why stand ye here all the day idle? And they said unto him, Because no man has hired us. We had not heard the gospel till now. No man's hired us. And he said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right that ye shall receive. Eleventh hour, five o'clock in the afternoon. It's the last hour of your life. You're 70 years old, 75 years old, maybe you're 80 years old, 90 years old. It's not too late to hear the, the invitation and come to the vineyard. In 2 Peter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but his long suffering word, not willing that any should perish. But all should come to repentance, even at the ninth hour. I've seen a lot of people come to God at the end of life. At the very end of life. This is a place that it happens a lot. People we baptize here, about half of them die the first year. May Roseboro used to sit right there where you're sitting right now today. She sat right there. She was my secretary for years. May called me one morning and she said, Brother Kelly, thank God my uncle is ready to be baptized. I've been working on him for years. He's ready to be baptized. He's in a nursing home in Oak Cliff. Will you go with me to baptize him? Now, this was years ago when we wasn't feeding down here during the day or none of that stuff. I didn't have any help down here or anything, and my back was out. And I have a bad back, and sometimes it gets out worse than yours, Paul. And I'm telling you, I can't hardly walk, man. And I've got no strength at all because it's pinching a nerve and, and I've just got no strength at all. And I said, May, my back's out. I'm going to try to find somebody to come and help me to baptize him. But yeah, I'll meet you there. Is that a nursing home over in Oak Cliff? I come by the church here. I look. I call different people. We didn't burn it. had a job back in those days. And so there wasn't anybody. Just wasn't anybody. And so I went, and I went over there, and, and, and she came and got in the car with me. And I said, May, I'm just, I'm dying. I don't know if I can do this. I don't even know if I can bend over to do this. I said, You know, uh, this, is, this is awful. I said, We don't, do you know if they got a bathtub up there? She said, I don't have any idea. She said, uh, uh, she's, I said, How big is he? She said, She said, it was seven foot, like, like two, huge, huge Goliath. This guy is huge. He's not real big. He's a skinny guy, but I mean, he's, he's, he's tall. He, he's Goliath. It's unbelievable. And I said, Lord, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. Let's pray. And we prayed, and I said, Lord, you're just going to have to supply the water. You're going to have to supply the place to do it, the bathtub. You're going to have to supply everything. You know the boat that I'm in. I just can't do nothing about it. And so we go up there, and I said, you go on into the room, and I'm going to scout around the hall, and I'm going to try to find out where the bathtub is. There's got to be a bathtub up there somewhere. And so I scout around the hall and come back around to his room, 
and she's in there with a nurse, and they got a gurney kind of thing that they're putting him from the bed onto this gurney. And and uh, May said, oh, this is a preacher. This is Brother Kelly. And uh, the nurse said, well, hi, Brother Kelly. I said, I'm taking him now for his whirlpool. I said, oh, really? <laughs> taking him for his whirlpool. And they took him on that gurney, and they just cranked him on that gurney down into the water, and there wasn't nothing sticking out but his head. I, all I had to do was just, <laughs> just said it was amazing. Now, I've told this story with May sitting here. Some of you have, have been here when I've told this story in front of May. This is the truth. God will supply the water at the 11th hour of life. On the other hand, I got a phone call from the Dickinson place over here, the guy working there. He said, I got a guy dying. Said they've told him he ain't gonna last another day or two. Will you come over? I said, sure. So I go over to him. I teach him Isaiah 53. I teach him about becoming a Christian. Tell him now, let's let's get you baptized and in the in the bathtub. He'd not. I go do it. And uh, I said, well, brother, you need to be baptized. I mean, you you got to do this. This is. This is life and death. You're not going to be alive tomorrow. No, I'm not going to do it. And uh, the guy that had called me, he said, well, can't you just pray over him? And, and, and I said, no, I can't. You, you can, but I can't because the Bible tells me what to do. And I have to teach him. And he has to repent. And he has to believe. And he has to have faith. And he has to confess. And he has to be baptized if I do it. Now, you can do it some other way, and that's between you and him and God, and so I don't know what they did, and I left, but they wouldn't be baptized. And I fully expect to see May's uncle there, and I fully do not expect to see the other guy there who had the chance, who received the call at the 11th hour. God will accept you if it's the last hour of your life if you come to him in the appointed way. Amen. What if you won't come in the appointed way? I don't have any idea. Isn't it wonderful that I am not the judge of the universe? That God is the judge of the universe. Verse 8. So when evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto the steward, Call ye the laborers and give them their hire beginning from the last, the guy that came at the eleventh hour, beginning from the last to the first. Then when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. Let's drop down to Matthew 20, uh, verse 10. But when the first came, they supposed that they should receive more. And they likewise received every man a penny. Jesus is very clear the wages are the same. The wages are everlasting life. It doesn't get any better than everlasting life. Verse 29. And everyone that had forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or fathers or mothers or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold. That's reward, separate subject. But what are you going to inherit? What's going to be the pay? Everlasting life and shall inherit everlasting life. Verse 11. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have worked but one hour, and thou hast made them equal to us, which is born the burden in the heat of the day. How do you feel about one who's been a rounder until late in life getting the same reward as you? Christians often carry the shortcomings of the world into their service for Christ. They're continually looking for shorter hours, bigger pay, and regardless of the uh, importance of the world, they want to quit when the clock strikes six or five or four they're as quick as they can get off work. 
Like Peter, men are always looking for their rights instead of their duties. Have you murmured against the good man of the house? Verse 13. But he answered and said unto them, and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Dost thou not agree with me for a penny? Take that to design, and go thy way. And I will give unto this last, as also unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Is I not evil because I am good? Envy is spoken of as dwelling in the eye, and giving a mag uh, malignant power. Uh, in Deuteronomy 15, verse 9, Beware that they be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and I be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him nothing. And he cry unto the Lord against thee, and uh, it be sin unto thee. Companionship with Jesus is the only compensation we get for spending all day, all your life, in service to the Lord in the vineyard. But Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the world. Companionship with Jesus, is it enough or is your eye evil? Jesus thinks that he did what was right. Notice in verse 4, he tells them, and he said to them, Go ye also in the vineyard, and what is right I'll give you. Jesus says that giving them everlasting life at the last hour is the right thing to do. He says the same thing in verse 7. Now down to verse 16. And so the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. For many are called, but few are chosen. God exercises mercy towards those that had disadvantage and unequal to others. The laborers were all equal in that each was ready to work when they were called. The eleventh hour men responded at the first opportunity. It's hard to believe sometimes that God loves us in spite of what we've done. And others find it a front that God doesn't love them because of what they've done. Verse 11, And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These have worked but one hour, and thou hast made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. The call represents all who hears the gospel call. The chosen, the Greek word here, represents choice or excellence. It's almost equal to the word perfect. These are the disciples who excel in, de in their uh, devoted service to the Lord. Many are called to do the work, but few excel in the work and become perfect. We want to become perfect. We want to do what he told us to do, take the gospel to the whole wide world, and thanks to you, we're doing it. We'd encourage our radio audience to go to our website at www.mainstreet-churchofchrist.com. We'd uh, encourage you now to put your faith and trust and confidence in God to save you. Believe the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Put your faith in God to save you. Repent of your sins. Be sorry for your sins. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. March right down here and make confession that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son, the living God. Repent of your sins. Be baptized into Christ. Have all your sins washed away. Won't you come now while we stand and sing?